Welcome to Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Current Affairs magazine. I am joined today by Amy Schiller. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Dartmouth College, the Society of Fellows. She also is the author of the new book, The Price of Humanity, How Philanthropy Went Wrong and How to Fix It which Corey Robin correctly calls a magical book. Amy Schiller, welcome to Current Affairs. It's such a, an honor to be here. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, you are critiquing philanthropy. You are telling us how we can think about it differently, how we can do philanthropy differently. Let's start with the critique. Your second chapter says is that giving, it says that giving has become shopping. I would love it if we could take apart what it means for giving to become shopping. Perfect. Uh, no better time to have this conversation than days before Giving Tuesday and the giving season when all of a sudden the masses begin to really pay attention in earnest to their charitable giving. And you'll see so many fundraising appeals coming out in, in even a stronger force than they do year round. So giving is shopping is the kind of mass permeation and understanding of philanthropy as a purchase or an investment that you're making. So in other words, treating giving as if it's an extension of your other market transactions. So examples of this include cause branded merchandise, brands like Tom's, brands like Red, the word Red in parentheses. And there's the idea is like, oh, if you buy these products, then you're actually giving in and sort of the bundle of money that you're handing over. Like your giving is built in because the brand is actually giving back and redistributing it. So it really makes it convenient for you, the giver slash shopper. So that's just one very obvious example. And the extension of that is an attitude towards giving that says, you know, I want to see the receipts behind like my dollars. I want to know exactly what impact my personal dollars generated. I want to know what social change I am personally responsible for. And there's a number of examples I elaborate on in the book, but essentially like this is the sort of mass absorption of a view of philanthropy that started with the billionaire class but has really infused many of our sensibilities to make giving much more, not as opposed to a counterpart to our commercial transactions, an extension of them. But as you point out in the book, there are kind of deep historical roots to this idea of giving as investing or buying something. You point out that the you know the the Christian idea often has been. You know, uh, give to the poor because you're investing in your salvation. It's there's a, a certain kind of parallel in the way that you're going. Well, absolutely, give, give the money no, and you can a, be a good a person. Point. And don't think it, it's yeah. not even to help them; it's to help you. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head there. And I should say, I don't mean that our contemporary billionaire class thought this up all by themselves. I yeah. mean that the vocabulary that we use today mm. to mm. kind of perpetuate that attitude you know, became popular first in the contemporary scene in high level giving. And I do trace that in the book with sort of the emergence of Bill Gates and of philanthro capitalism and that whole sort of set of ideologies that culminates in effective altruism. That is the sort of contemporary version of utilitarianism. But yes, you rightly point out that this attitude does have its roots much further back and I use St. Augustine as my exemplar of them. And he literally has words in his sermons as he's trying to convince Christians to target their giving where it will have the most impact, if any of that sounds familiar to you, mm. to say, you give like a merchant who sends his wares to faraway lands and hope that they will return to a profit to him eventually. And that giving to the poor means that they will transport your good deeds to heaven. And as I said in another interview, presumably they do this via the service entrance. <laughs> you know, it's this, this real instrumentalization of poor people and their needs for the gratification and benefit and salvic 
the salvic benefit of the donor themselves. Yeah, so you say, you know, that the pitch that it conflated giving and investing a, a surrender of money that would not vanish into the ether, but would return eventually in the form of rewards for the giver. And if you cite Pope Leo the first preaching in, you know, cost benefit terms. And one of the things that you point out is that this kind of giving, not only is it quite self-interested in that if you're just giving to save your soul, you know, are you clearly not doing it just because you care about other people? I mean, early in the book, you talk about, you know, seeing people as human beings versus seeing them as this thing called the poor that you must give to or the blind or the sick. And it, you know, it sort of by definition in a very obvious way reduces right. them, eliminates their humanity and boils them down to their deprivation as the sort of sole fact of interest about their existence. Yes, absolutely right. So the starting point of the book is that philanthropy means love of humanity. And so the mm. challenge is to say, how do we define humanity? Is humanity defined, and I know I can say this on this podcast, in a very biopolitical sense, as in mere survival, survival for the sake of being economically productive, strong in numbers, sort of strong as a, you know, planetary labor force, or more recently, perhaps an extra planetary labor force? Or is it a definition of humanity that's much more capacious, much more appreciative of the qualities that actually make us human? That is our imagination, our creativity, our ability to collaborate and build an enduring world and to have multiple perspectives negotiating shared space in a shared world. So the challenge for me was, okay, yes, there are some forms of philanthropy that distort that understanding of humanity to be this very reductive form that you describe, where people are sort of reduced to their symbolic use. They're just avatars, I say, of desperation. Or... Um, there, there are ways of doing philanthropy that actually affirm this broad vision of what makes us worthy and what makes us really worthy of love as human beings. You know, you open with this wonderful kind of mad lib of the the classic charitable pitch, uh, which I just read a little bit of here. Insert name is insert number years old. A insert heartwarming detail with insert endearing physical feature. They suffer from, <laughs> insert, ailment every day. They struggle to insert activity and has to travel, insert distance, just to get, insert item. Uh, yet with just, insert, small dollar amount, insert name, could get the item they need. For just, insert, sense, per, insert, unit of time, you could save, insert, name's life. <laughs> yes, I'm glad that resonated with you. I had a lot of fun writing it. Yeah. Well, you've worked in fundraising, so you've been exposed to a lot of these kinds of appeals. <laughs> Absolutely. It's my experience in fundraising as a consultant who is embedded in a, you know, a number of nonprofits and having to traffic in these rhetorical strategies. I mean, it's not like anyone is sort of oblivious to their manipulations. It's just like, well, this is what work. And then we have to ask ourselves, why does it work? Mm -hmm. Now, there are a number of kind of obvious critiques of philanthropy that can be made. And, and you do go through in the book things like when the rich are deciding what the good causes are, then their, you know, their priorities become social priorities. One of the things, though, that I think is totally fascinating and novel about the argument that you make in this book is the effect of altruists, who we've discussed on this program before, we might get a little bit more into. They have this pitch that says, well, you shouldn't give to universities and art museums because they are frivolous they, or compared to morally the suffering of children with malaria. You know, it's immoral to donate to something as trivial as an art museum when there are all sorts of sick and poor and dying people in the world. And shouldn't we prioritize now? Now, obviously, the effect of algebra is also going in very weird directions where they say the most moral thing you could work on is artificial intelligence. Leaving that aside, there is something inherently compelling, I think, about that argument on the surface, which is, well, shouldn't you care about the worst suffering? Shouldn't that be your priority? But you almost flip it on its head and come to the ultimate conclusion that philanthropy we should get to a point where it's about the trivial things. So, or the seemingly trivial or pointless or, you know, the things that give us joy. 
So I want you to take us down the path of your argument so that we could get there. <laughs> okay, thank you. So my concern is really the absolutism of the effective altruist view. And you gesture towards that. And the effective altruists are just one extreme expression of what I think is, for many people, very compelling, which is to say, I do want to address the worst suffering, the most marginal cases of need or highest need, rather. My concern is twofold. One, to say that is the only or the most ethical way of approaching giving is to sort of reduce all of our engagement with the rest of the world to just survival, just helping the maximum number of people survive, as if there are no other registers of human experience that are important, that are worthy, and that need to be sustained alongside our very correct and valid struggles for, for justice and for making sure that we have a world that can sustain the lives as many of its inhabitants as possible. So one problem I have is with just the kind of flattening effect that that argument has. The second is that it's, it depoliticizes what are ultimately political questions. So for me, the important thing is that, yes, of course, people do need the basics to survive. They do need health care and medication and housing and food. Of course, they need all of those things, but we need to make sure that those are provided as rights and provisions of democratic institutions. So the sort of undergirding of my argument, which is to say philanthropy should be focusing on you know, the things that make us human, that give us joy, these non-urgent needs, but rather these sort of evergreen capacities and passions that we have. What has to undergird that is a commitment to a much fuller infrastructure of government support for our basic needs, because those should be provided as matters of right, not as matters of discretion or of having sort of struck the right emotional cord or the right persuasion of self-interest of others. They really should not be subject to that level of instability. I suppose one way to think about this is to ask yourself the question, what should GoFundMe be for? And yeah. right now, it's often for, you know, paying for you know, serious medical expenses or, you know, to the cost of a funeral right. or things that, right. you know, people really shouldn't have to be begging strangers for. And right. you can say, well, isn't it more moral to donate to help people pay their medical expenses than to donate to, you know, a community garden or some arts project? But GoFundMe is a terrible way to run a healthcare system, a healthcare financing system. You want that That's part right. solved. But importantly, in your argument, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a GoFundMe. That doesn't mean that that sort of thing, that crowdfunding, this should disappear. It should just have a different function. It struck me for a long time that philanthropy is the only kind of money or maybe the kind of money with maybe just the most leeway to take a very long view and also a very wide view of who it is supposed to benefit. So which is to say money that's used for for-profit initiatives has to start generating profit by a certain time and like on a frequent and recurring basis. Money that's used for social financing from governments. Now, some of this would be solved, of course, if we weren't so in the thrall of austerity politics. But even then, governments are often under pressure to be as cost efficient as possible. It's not quite legible to say, well, let's build something, you know, truly like beautiful or grand with this public money that is mm. often difficult to sort of build enough consensus around to be done democratically or sort of in those institutions. Instead, it's philanthropy that can do what the Cleveland Museum of Arts motto suggests, which is build things that exist for the benefit of all the people forever. In my opinion, philanthropic money, and, and not as even necessarily at the grand scale, but even at the small scale, philanthropic money is really money that we can use to think far, that this, that long of a horizon and that wide of a scope. Well, what's it so interesting as a kind of hinted here about your argument is that I think as a as leftists, our instinct is to say, oh, you know, philanthropy is, you know, he's kind of the same as the effective altruist is, you know, this spending money. How can in a time of crisis, in a time of 
you know, severe deprivation, spending money endowing various buildings on public arts projects. But you say, in fact, you know, things should be, yeah, directed towards things that are more urgent. But perhaps not. Perhaps it is the case that philanthropy is this sphere where we can fund the things that are difficult to justify on utilitarian grounds. Correct. And I, I know that you, Nathan, are sympathetic to that. I was just looking at your article of, uh, I can't remember the title, in K- in the frivolous or the no, oh, in praise of the pointless. This is about a piazza in New Orleans that I exactly. think was private money was raised to fund this really stupid piazza, and it serves no function, but it's beautiful. And I it got me thinking of some of the issues in this book, which is like, okay, but yeah. how do you have spaces like that? Right? Someone's got to be willing to spend money on something that doesn't yield a return. Right. That's exactly right. Well, I want to go over a couple of touch points about that. So I'm glad you said the word spheres because you're reminding me that the political theorist Michael Walzer's separate spheres theory was really important to me understand, like sort of formulating this argument, which is to say in Walzer, he's talking about like spheres of justice where there are kind of different frameworks for what constitutes justice. There's not one sort of monolithic definition. And so I sort of borrowed that framing is to say like, we can have a just world where we understand that there's some money that is used for the necessities of survival and the basic needs of a dignified life. And then there is some money that does not have to follow that rubric that can follow a much more expansive mandate of Mm. what kinds of things it creates and builds. And the other thing that's important about that is that sometimes those things, as I think you're getting at in your Um, in praise of the pointless piece, is that those things actually run up against the sort of totalizing ambitions of neoliberal capitalism in a really important way. Creating those spaces that are pointless, creating those things that don't serve utilitarian purposes, they actually are sanctuaries that remind us that not everything we do has to be in service towards the kind of struggle for for basic rights and basic justice that we can and should. And indeed, I think what makes us, again, human is that we can do things that are much more capacious and imaginative than that. And the final thing I'll say about that is that's why um, the Notre Dame Cathedral was such yes, a central... Yes, I was, I was just about to bring this up, actually. Yes. Uh- <laughs> right. But, so tell me how you well, responded to that. It's so chapter. funny because, as I say, here's a, another t- example where you, I think you flip on its head the instinctual left reaction, which is that, so when Notre Dame caught fire, there was fun, instantly money poured in from all over the world. People love Notre Dame and, you know, they wanted to restore Notre Dame. So they got tons and tons of money to, to fix Notre Dame. And of course, lots of people immediately comment, you know, it's time of su- it's terrible suffering, people begging for, you know, to have the, with their medical bills and their, you know, just to pay for their insulin and whatever. But Notre yeah. Dame, the stupid cathedral, gets all this money. As I understand it, you're making, and you can kind of clarify uh, whether this is the correct uh, statement of your point, is, well, ultimately, don't we want to fix the part where people are deprived of their basic needs so that... The area of philanthropy is like for when a cathedral burns down. (laughs) That's right. And you've described it perfectly. And I think the sequencing of these things, and this is where Walzer is really handy, this idea of separate spheres is so important because I think what the controversy, the backlash, the money raised for Notre Dame was this spillover from political conflict because it's a very important piece of context that Macron in 2017, just two years before the fire at Notre Dame, had come into office and implemented massive tax cuts that largely benefited the wealthy of France, instituted austerity politics and slashing of social welfare spending. There have been protests for months, the Yellow Vest protests that people might recall from the working class of France against these economic reforms. So there was this massive political contestation that because there was no resolution to it, it sort of spilled over to say, well, if our politicians aren't going to be sympathetic to these demands, then it is our billionaire's responsibility to take them more seriously. Like that sort of that moral and sort of normative demand of one's government 
then sort of carried over to wherever the money was, you know, that now it's the private citizens of France who should be ashamed for having pledged all this money for Notre Dame, when clearly they could have pledged it to resolve the social crisis. Mm. And it was that transposition that concerned me for a number of reasons. One, again, the depoliticization, the privatization of what are very right and just political demands is to, to, to just say like, well, you know, whatever works, you know, <laughs> whatever the, whatever, regardless of the consequences to our sort of political system, we're just going to go get the money wherever it can be found. I can certainly understand the pragmatism of it, but I think there's some terrible unintended consequences to that. And the other, again, is this flattening effect, which is to say, like, until, you know, we resolve these social crises, we can't possibly make space for the value of a cathedral whose like gravitational importance to not just the wealthy of France, to everyone in France and to many people worldwide was so palpable in the moment when it burned. So to negate this thing that drew people together in such a powerful way that was such a source of profound attachment of connection to something larger, that they that doesn't matter because our energy should be completely and totally focused on this political struggle and everything is subsumed into that. That's the way to go. I thought, no, that's not right. There's more to our collective life than this. And we can't lose that understanding. Well, one of the central points that comes across in your book is ordinary people, everyone deserves beautiful things, right? Yes. And we deserve the palaces for the people. We deserve cathedrals. We deserve museums that everyone can go to for free. And you have this wonderful, you know, this the left has historically called for bread and roses. And you say that, the, you know, the probably the correct way to think about how we fund stuff is government for the bread, philanthropy for the roses. So yes. you know, the state is supposed to take care of making sure that nobody is horribly deprived. And then once we have that, once we have that foundation, then civil society can pool its resources to build things that don't serve those basic utilitarian functions. Correct. Absolutely yeah. right. And, you know, I get this question, and you may be gearing to ask it as well, of like, how does this really translate to the here and now, right? What does this mean for me yeah. next Tuesday when I have to, like, you know, sure. decide where I'm giving my money? And to me, the important thing is, like, as with any sort of visionary collective struggle, you have to sort of give for the world that you have and for the world that you want to build. That kind of like we can we can hold two thoughts at once, we can do two things at once. To me, that's the most important contribution I can make in this book is to say like not everything is reducible to the urgency, the very right and valid urgency of the struggle for economic justice, that there are things that complement it that preserve humanity's sort of greatest capacity so that they're kind of always there for us as reinforcements, as sanctuaries, and as sort of exemplars of the vision of what we can all be as a society. You're listening to the Current Affairs podcast from Current Affairs magazine in New Orleans, Louisiana. Current Affairs is a registered 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we depend entirely on reader subscriptions and donations. You'll notice we have no ads, no mattresses, no recruiters, no sports betting. If you can help us in our mission to build independent progressive media, please visit currentaffairs.org slash donate to make a donation or currentaffairs.org slash subscribe to subscribe to our beautiful print magazine. Thank you so much for supporting our work. Now, back to the program. I take another point about how we should act in the here and now to be that those of us who wish to be philanthropists in the sense of lovers of, of humanity shouldn't just pursue uh, charitable works, but should be part of larger struggles for economic and social justice. And and the critique of the effective altruists, which I, I've made this critique too in a long article called Defective Altruism, and one of the yes, central beautiful. points there was it's depoliticized. This whole idea is that all you have to think about in, is how rich people ought to spend their money. But it's like, OK, but you need yeah. to be part of campaigns to alter the conditions that are causing you to have to ask this question. 
Yes. And I have some some proposals in here that are like You do. Okay, yes. You have what, practical proposals. I do have practical, believe it or not, folks, she's got practical proposals. <laughs> and I think the central one, this is sort of the one that connects this vision of what giving could be and what circumstances we need to sort of make that possible is the idea of a giving wage that we sort of increase our demand from a living wage, which is already, I think, rather like barely adequate to the idea of like, what if everyone was paid enough that they could afford to contribute, that they could mm -hmm. afford to be a philanthropist at some scale? Mm -hmm. I love that because, yes, one thing that you argue very strongly in this is that philanthropy shouldn't just be for the rich. Everyone should have extra. Everyone should have enough to give away. I love that contrast between the living and the giving wage because living is its bare subsistence. Oh, we want wages that we can cause us to subsist. Now, that's a very reasonable demand at a time when it's impossible to pay your rent on your pay. However, we really ought to raise our expectations and have as a you know a standard that you know people ought to be able to have enough spare cash to where when there is some project like uh, I don't know building the next Statue of Liberty, you cite the Statue of Liberty yes. as an example of something that the community of non wealthy people came together yes. to help support that those sorts of things can happen. Yes. You asked earlier, what should GoFundMe be for? And we have our counterpart right there. We have our early crowdfunding victory right there in the story of the Statue of Liberty, right? Where the readers of Joseph Pulitzer's paper, The New York World, over a number of months, like they sent in contributions of, you know, 10 cents, five cents, and they were all listed in the paper to raise over $100,000 for the pedestal and the installation of the Statue of Liberty. And Pulitzer says, this is not a gift. The, the statue is not a gift from the millionaires of France to the millionaires of America. It's from the whole people of France to the whole people of America. So we have in our own history, this vision of, yes, like crowdfunding and of small dollar giving as a, as a genuinely world building exercise. Another thing you do in the book is you go through and, you know, you look at some of history's most famous philanthropists uh, then and now, you know, in the, in the past, uh, Jane Addams and Andrew Carnegie, in the present, LeBron James, Mackenzie Scott. And, you know, you, you find in each of them your problematic aspects of the way that they approached. I mean, <laughs> and Carnegie <laughs> writes this book that essentially argues that it's fine to make your money however you like, uh, no matter how exploitative and horrible it, it you are, but your job afterwards is to serve humanity. Right. But you point out that there are there are lessons from the ways that he did choose to serve humanity, like building wonderful libraries, that we can take. So so maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the, the, the lessons you get from profiling these particular cases. Yeah, no, thank you. Something I didn't write about in the book, but I think is helpful for thinking about why Carnegie's work was as valuable as I think it was, is that Carnegie built this massive nationwide network of libraries, and he wanted them to be beautiful and grand structures. You use the phrase palaces for the people. That's Carnegie's phrase, that he, he had the leeway to do it that way. And those libraries are still anchors of communal life throughout the United States. And there are some actually globally as well, that they bundle together the provision of basic social needs. So unhoused people are able to be there for warmth and shelter, for restrooms, for other social services. Arguably, we overburden our libraries with some of those tasks today, but that's a story for another time. And there are these like incredibly grand spaces of exploration, discovery, human aspiration, community, and beauty, as you point out. So you have this example from Carnegie, and we're really just talking about like the results, right? How do we sort of judge the results of his giving? And I judge that very highly, especially when compared to his counterparts today, like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, who care not a whit for the, the earthbound community, for the local population yeah. of any scale, but really I think only of building space colonies in which, by the way, we are, we would all be enslaved. So, you know, it does seem to be the implication. They don't state that outright, but every time you hear them describe it, you really get that vibe. Yeah. I mean, it's the ultimate offshoring, right? 
<laughs> that's obviously the game. So if you contrast like, wow, okay, so this is a philanthropy that, and by no means does this, you know, legitimize or excuse the abuses of workers that are associated with the accumulation. It's just to say like, let's just narrow our goalposts a little bit and say this vision of philanthropy, however oligarchic in its origin, created a common world. And this version of billionaire philanthropy is going to utterly dissolve the common world and utterly negate the sort of higher gifts and capacities of human beings. So can we borrow from Carnegie's example, especially to counter the ambitions of Bezos and Musk and their counterparts today? Mm -hmm. So that was one. I mean, the concluding example in the book is LeBron James. LeBron James and his counterpart, Jane Addams, founder of Whole House, what I loved about those two is that they create institutions, Whole House in Chicago, for Jane Addams, the I Promise School and Housing Community and other sort of network of nonprofits in Akron for LeBron. They really exemplify this ability to do both and to keep one's eye trained on. This is not just to serve a functional purpose. We are serving functional purposes because that's that's what's needed at this moment. But our ultimate aim is to really help people cultivate themselves as full human beings. Mm. Um, and Adams did that at Hull House by really emphasizing that poor and working class people want space for culture and recreation and community. And LeBron does it with this one uh, gesture in particular, which is giving every kid at the I Promise School a bike and a helmet and saying, when I was a kid, having a bike was what made me feel free. Those are LeBron's words. Mm -hmm. And you think, boy, feeling free does not really lend itself to quantifiable documentation. It's not a concrete ROI kind of thing. Like if you want kids to feel free, that means you are really doing this because you want them to flourish as people without any oversight or control or kind of surveillance of how that happens, at least in that, in, you know, when the bikes are concerned. Yes, and we can we can contrast that at the beginning. Uh, we're talking about you know flat the flattening of humanity that comes with seeing people as the poor or the sick, you know, and the poor in need of alms and in need of you know money. What what if we thought more? What if we spoke to people about what kinds of things make them feel free? You know, yes. what, what do they want out of life? And it's not just like, oh, please don't let me die. <laughs> You know, which is we don't <laughs> right. want people to starve to death. So you want to have, you know, you want to feed people, you want to have full belly, but you want the roses. Everyone's entitled to the roses. And it's important that's right. that that's not just rhetoric to take that seriously, right? When we say bread and roses, you know, we say it a lot and it lapses into, into cliche, but you really yeah. I think you shouldn't just build a school for kids who don't have a good school. It should be a beautiful school. It should be a school where whenever they go to it, it's breathtaking. <laughs> Right. Well, the the phrase that I use for that is magnificent. Magnificent. Yes, yes, yes. You say this. <laughs> and that, you know, it's that value of like really raising your sights, really raising yeah. your game. It's like, oh, how? Yes. Magnificence really encapsulates exactly like, breathtaking and beautiful and all those things that give us a sense of a sense of dignity, a sense of vision, a sense of feeling valued in the world that yes, that's the thing that philanthropy can do. And we really quite desperately need it to provide that at this time. You know, again, those those on the left might, you know, when they hear the term philanthropy, and I, I, I hope they read your book, because I think it, it, this very, this tendency would be turned off by the word philanthropy, because you think that philanthropy would only exist in a world where there are billionaires, right? Right. If we tax the rich, if we tax all their money away, then, you know, philanthropy disappears because we've redistributed wealth. We've solved the problem. Philanthropy only exists in a, in a society where some people have too much wealth. But you make the argument that you could tax billionaires out of existence. But because of your, your whole idea that ordinary people should be able to endow things with resources, we can imagine a much, much, much more equal world that still has philanthropy, that love of humanity, that donating to the to common projects, donating time, donating resources, you know, that doesn't have to go away. And in fact, it can achieve its true and more beautiful purpose. Yes, everyone should read my book. Um, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I, yes, I agree. <laughs> yes, but, but, uh, and I am so energized by conversations 
with my friends and my comrades on the left because they know that what I'm saying is so counterintuitive. I know that yeah. what I'm saying feels like such a, a potential defense of very like aristocratic norms, a defense of yeah. kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, legitimizing this power structure that we're supposedly fighting against. And it definitely is a delicate, you know, threading of things to say, like, we can retain this sensibility, we can redistribute it in a way that is widespread. And I think the most important thing is, we actually really need to do that, because there are so many pressures now that say, all of life, all of our individual lives, and all of our collective lives are kind of subsumed to the struggle for survival. This is like, you know, the living wage is just one expression of this, right? That if we are all focused on surviving, being economically productive, being economically sustainable, there's so much pressure to think in this way in ways that we don't even realize. And it's gotten to us to the extent to go back to the beginning that we think like everything is a purchase. Everything is, you know, a for-profit transaction. That's how deeply these ideas have sedimented in us. And so more than that, I actually think it's it's vital that everyone embrace this idea that like, no, there is something grander in store for us and that we want to advocate for it, not as the kind of indulgence of the elite, but as a value of everyone. Yeah, I will say to our listeners and to our readers in the transcript version that Amy has not written the book that you necessarily think she has written from hearing that it's about how to fix philanthropy, because you might think, you might assume that she has written a guide for wealthy people to how to spend their money differently. But it's totally, it's such a delightful surprise throughout for me to think, you know, it will really get you to think. I love, one of the things I love is that you, uh, if I wasn't enjoying myself enough, my favorite book in the world is uh, A Pattern Language uh, by uh, Christopher Alexander and others. And then, and then at the end, you talk about the wonder, all the wonderful things that are in A Pattern Language, this just eccentric kind of supposed architecture guide, but it's kind of a guide about how to live, live the good life. And you're like, these are the yes. things that we need, the beautiful and the strange. <laughs> wow. Wow. What an, what incredible series. Serendipity, and to think that that was waiting for you at the epilogue. I know, I know. <laughs> wow, that really yes. was <laughs> <Pattern language. laughs> so the end. Pattern like so funny. I met someone on a train who was a city planner, and I knew <laughs> somehow I knew that if I told him I referenced Bernard Rudofsky, that I would absolutely have his attention. And I was right. This is another thing about the book. I will say that, like, I really enjoyed sprinkling in. Such an eclectic spread of references and texts yes. uh, and like pop culture and literature um, and architecture theory, as you point out. It really one of the greatest pleasures of writing this book. And I hope it's one of the great pleasures of reading it. Let us also say that your writing style is fun because this is not clear from the cover of a book. You know, when you're talking about Seneca, you say, here's the thing about Seneca. This is the start of a chapter, founder of Stoic philosophy. He's a little intense. I think it's fair to call him uptight. Rigid, even. Having extremely high standards is kind of his whole deal. You're a very conversational writer in a way that makes it pleasant. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That is that's something I really treasure about the book, and I'm yeah. so glad I was able to... It's like sitting down and having a chat to, to read Good. it. So. Okay, Good. well, so the book is The Price of Humanity, How Philanthropy Went Wrong, and How to Fix It, available from Melville House. Amy Schiller, thank you so much for joining us on Current Affairs today. Such a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Nathan. I can't imagine a better interviewer. The Current Affairs Podcast is a product of Current Affairs Magazine. If you are not subscribed to Current Affairs Magazine, visit currentaffairs.org slash subscribe today and get our glorious print edition. The Current Affairs Podcast is released regularly every week on patreon.com slash current affairs. Thanks for listening.